Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Lane Little, and I'm director of the Polly Friedman Art Gallery at Misericordia University in Dallas, Pennsylvania, which is in Northeast Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining us for Compulsory Measures, the virtual roundtable. In this series of conversations, we look at the exhibition Compulsory Measures, Repetition and Ritual. And through the uh, eyes of each of the eight artists represented, this exhibition will be on display until October 18. This series was made possible in part by the National Endowment of the Humanities CARES grant called Humanities in the Time of COVID-19, Fostering Community Dialogue. Tonight, we are so lucky to have seven and possibly all eight artists from the show. I'll introduce them briefly, and then we'll talk about how their work contributes uniquely to this theme of repetition and ritual. As we go along, listeners, we would love to hear from you, too. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions or respond to anything the artists are saying. Our first artist, uh, Rennie Gower, is the curator of the exhibition. She's taught art at Virginia Commonwealth University until her retirement in 2018. She's a practicing artist, teacher, and curator whose work has been recognized internationally, most recently by the Pollock Krasner Foundation. Her artwork is represented in many prestigious collections and has been exhibited at international and national venues for over 40 years. George Benitez is an assistant professor in the Communication Arts Department at Virginia Commonwealth University, where he teaches drawing, art theory, and the history of visual communications. He is a native of Cuba who spent his formative years in Belgium and is fluent in French and Spanish. His work reflects an earlier career in advertising, an interest in the American culture wars, and his study of the links between words, images, and demagogic politics. Christy Dietz is a professor in the art discipline at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. With Rene Gar, she co curated the exhibition Fabrication that traveled to art museums, university art galleries, and art centers. She frequently serves as a visiting artist and has led numerous painting and drawing workshops at national and international venues. Her work includes painting, sculpture, and digital media. In her series on display at the gallery, she uses the trope of draped fabric to challenge expectations of what painting does as it lies in the crease of abstraction and representation. Al Danier's work encompasses the areas of drawing, painting, printmaking, and installation, shown in solo exhibitions throughout the United States and numerous national and international juried and invitational exhibitions and publications. Her work is included in the Artist Viewing Program at the Drawing Center in New York City, and she's a past recipient of the Utah Artist Fellowship Award. Originally from England, Al is an associate professor and area head of painting and drawing at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Joan Elliott has a process-oriented approach towards painting, working with both geometric patterning and landscape imagery. Inspired by recent travels to Spain, Portugal, Turkey, and Uzbekistan, she has researched and documented a wide variety of geometric patterning on site. She layers transcribed patterns and thread-like line work to build new arrangements, leaving densely graphic and radiant structures within her paintings. Joan has been an instructor at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts Studio School for over 25 years. Her work is represented by Reynolds Gallery in Richmond, Virginia, and the Gallery de Belleville in Montreal, Quebec, and is included in many corporate and private collections. Stephen Pearson is the Joan Devlin Colley Chair in a Creative Expression and the Arts and Professor of Studio Art at McDaniel College in Westminster, Maryland, where he has been teaching studio art courses since 2004. He serves as Chair of the Art and Art History Department and directs the college's Esther Prangley Rice Gallery. Stephen's work ranges from still lifes using constructions of commonplace objects to non-objective through order and structure provides the connecting thread in this development, echoing his early experiences in the Navy. 
Jennifer Prince is an associate professor at Hollins University. In her studio practice, Jennifer gravitates toward meditative processes, most recently focused on mixed media drawings made with a gentle and deliberate mark making. She places importance on the artist's touch as a means to create an intrinsic presence within her work. Prince's art has been exhibited in numerous solo and group exhibitions across the United States and abroad. Tanya Sostich works across the media of printmaking, drawing, and the book arts. She is a professor of art at the University of Richmond. She's a recipient of the Paulette Krasner Grant National Endowment for the Arts Southern Arts Foundation, Federation Visual Arts Fellowship and Soros Foundation Open Society Institute Exhibition Support Grant. Her work is included in numerous collections and has been recognized in the United States and abroad. So as you can see, we have a wide range of talents and interests represented here in the gallery. And we'll um, start with just some starter questions and we'll see where the conversation takes us. But we'll start with Jennifer and Al. And the first question that we want to know is, what is a unique interpretation that your work contributes to the theme of compulsory measures? Um. Yeah, thank you so much, Lane, and um, thank you for hosting this. Um, my work, just thinking about the question, um, my work basically addresses complex systems as well as minute detail. And for me, this is what I, I would consider to be compulsive <laughs> in my work, if you will. Um, I, I, I am definitely, I would describe myself as an obsessive mark maker and um, I think that is pretty evident in my work. Um, but yeah, I, I think when creating the work, what's important to me is coming up with the system and then using that system in some way to create the final aesthetic. Wow, I think that's a great question. And first of all, I should say I'm really honored to be part of this group listening to everyone's bio. So thank you, Lane and Rennie and everyone. Um, one of the things I thought about um, with my work and what might be my unique contribution or the way that I look at this idea of compulsory measures in making um, is the importance on focus and how um, in some ways in our world today, we live in a, a world where we're, our attention is always going in so many different directions. And so when I can come into my studio and make in a very focused, deliberate way, um, then I'm doing something that's almost counter to all the main currents of our world today. And it becomes a very um, engaging um, way of making. It becomes a very spiritual way of making for me and just that sense of the calm and the focus that making lines or making nuanced passages with graphite can do. And I would also add that it's a very loving way of making um, because what is more loving than giving your full attention to something or something, something or someone. Um, and so I think that thread ties through my work um, quite always. Um, and it has been um, an important reason that I've wanted to continue to get into my studio throughout all of 2020. Thanks so much, Jennifer. I'll open the question to anybody else on the panel who'd want to talk about the unique contribution. Sounds like Erin's raring to go for the next question, but thank you so much for mentioning focus and these complexities. It's something that um, we're working on with our students as they're um, adjusting to this. And some students are, are completely online. Some students are doing hybrid courses. So we're all competing for our attention. Our second question is, um, and this is for Christy and Rennie, um, how does your choice of medium enhance the idea of ritual repetition? Or conversely, how does ritual and repetition enhance your work? And again, since we have so many artists with working in different media, after our first two responses, feel free to jump in. Should I go first? Okay, I'll, I'll just read a, a brief paragraph so I don't wander. <laughs> Um, I use acrylic paint to illusionistically describe a history of folds and wrinkles in cloth. The practice of obsessively painting extreme details is ritualistic in that it 
brings order and meaning out of chaos. The wrinkles and folds of illusionistic painting create a fluid visual structure and conceptual entity that moves in infinite directions um, like ritual. It both focuses and expands consciousness. I think I'm sort of repeating what the first two people said. <laughs> Right. I think we probably could all say the same thing in eight different ways and really be saying the same thing. I think what is interesting to me is that, you know, people or humanity is wired intrinsically to look for pattern and, um, and to um, seek it out. Um, and it's a, it's a survival mechanism. It's also like the, the basis of all scientific inquiry that leads to all the knowledge breakthroughs of, of the world. But without pattern, there is extreme chaos. I mean, <laughs> it's like um, we wouldn't survive uh, without some way to sort of categorize, organize. And we all do it differently, but we're all looking for that, that lifeline, if you will. And one thing that inspired me um, to actually curate this exhibition was just this fascination with the need to, you know, make sense out of things and to give yourself a way to, to um, have a lifeline for yourself and for others, maybe through your art and through your process. Um, I work in all kinds of materials from acrylic to encaustic to cut paper, and it really doesn't matter to me. It's as long as my hands are invested in the materials. Um, and that it is a physical activity for me, not just a conceptual one. Um, <clears throat> and I think we all sort of like develop systems to start us. And then we build in the human, the human component because we're doing it all by hand and we want the system to break down or we want to follow the deviant things that happen as we try to be perfect. We know we aren't. And, um, the nuances that happen when the imperfection occurs, I think is where the magic happens. Let me follow up with this question. In terms of repetition and ritual, with two um, of our artists talked about the physicality of it, the illusion, do you have um, rituals that you do in preparation for your work? Do you listen to a particular piece of music? Are there... Um, spaces that you need in order to be able to be very mindful about your work? I'd say that's definitely true. Um, I usually uh, have special shoes I wear that have little fuzzy things <laughs> sticking out of them that make my feet feel really great. Uh, I also will turn on NPR and so that um, uh, but sometimes the classical music uh, or um, Oh, Simply Folk, I like that one too, uh, that really helps me uh, sort of settle down and quiet my mind. Uh, then uh, studying wrinkles and folds is sort of crazy in a way. <laughs> but uh, once I, I get into it, it is uh, very focusing. And um, uh, I think like Jennifer said, for me, kind of a spiritual experience. Um, then also, uh, I think... Uh, through the process it reveals and conceals things um, about myself, about what I'm contemplating um, of other people, of our um, relationships to uh, history. Um, um, one of the things I think about, and I'd be curious to hear from others in the group, is the reality that I'm an extreme introvert. Um, you know, so my day job is I'm, I'm a professor and in normal times, my studio becomes my sanctuary because that's kind of my, my place to retreat uh, and be alone and kind of um, recharge on multiple levels. And so um, in some ways, this past year has been an artist's dream as, you know, we've been able to continue to work at home. Um, and use that time in, in productive ways. So I'd be curious if anyone else identifies that way. I was going to say that one thing I purposefully do as the paintings kind of get halfway through or three quarters way through is I'll switch to smaller brushes to kind of slow it down. And I don't, I don't know, it just, it seems like an important step in the process. No, I think um, for me, it's interesting, uh, Jennifer, that you brought up the 
the events of this year and how it's uh, played into our art practice. And this is something I've been thinking a lot about, like how is this changing the way I work or how I view myself in the studio because I'm, my studio is in, in my home and so I'm, I'm there a lot, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, it is, it is interesting, this idea of a sanctuary and um, where Christy mentioned that she listens to, to jazz or NPR. In a way, I'm the opposite. I have to, when I get in my zone, quite often it's very loud music, <laughs> very loud dance music from the 90s or something. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it is purely just being in that zone. But I mean, it, not always, it just depends what it takes to get there. And um, certainly I've, I've, like many of us, have, have been really reassessing how I work in the studio and what works best for me. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, I guess it, for me, it depends on the, where I'm at in the work. Uh, if it's the early stages where I might be um, either tracing parts of old paintings or gathering those tracings, um, then I like to listen to books on tape. Um, things that uh, I, when I don't have to think too much about where the work's going and I can listen to something, uh, the books on tape make me want to get into the studio because uh, they, you know, if it's a compelling story, I want to get back and hear while I'm working. So I love listening to, to audiobooks. But then when it gets into the meat of the work, when I really have to start to think about the ways to organize all the chaos that's there, um, then I, I can't have that on. Um, and, it, you know, um, I, that's what I need to focus. And it either goes to jazz or uh, Beastie Boys, um, which they help me focus a little bit, um, you know, uh, old school 90s rap. I'm into it. Tanya, welcome. Uh, we were talking about different, um, how does ritual and repetition feed your work? How does your work speak to the theme of ritual and repetition, if you'd like to respond? So, um Repeat and ritual. Oh my gosh, I am right now in a deep need of repeat and ritual of some kind, you know, <laughs> something, something that repeats, something that's not outrageous and is happening for the first time. So, um, um, well, for one thing, I make prints. I'm a printmaker. So there is the process itself is associated with repetition, although the longer I make art, the less I seem interested in making multiples. You know, I'm sort of using it for different, using printmaking for different things, um, sometimes multiples. But um, I don't so much, I mean, I, the, the motifs in my work repeat, the shapes, the forms, you know, repeat and so on. For me, they're you know, the, 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 they repeat the way notes will repeat in um, a piece of a music. They're kind of like building blocks. Um, uh, but, you know, the repetition of, you know, repetition is something I also associate with studio work itself, you know, in order... Um, I don't know about you guys, but you know, I am most productive when I have a long stretch of days ahead of me when I can count on some sort of a schedule. And the older I am, the fussier I am, I seem to be about it. <laughs> and um, so that kind of, you know, wh where you are able to, re you know, establish almost this ritualistic thing in the studio. Um, you know, that is sort of where it's at, where, where kind of that's when my brain fully engages. So. Thanks so much. Yeah, I am also looking for something familiar in my yeah. daily yeah. work. I find that very comforting. And especially when the summer when we had these long stretches of I don't know what's going to happen next. So I made sure I got up at 5.30 a.m. and walked the dog out to the river because for whatever reason, people discovered that we were living near a river. And so everybody was on the river like all day long. It was hard to find 
as an isolated time to go and 5 30 a.m was it but that was that that was just a what we do to kind of get in the zone yeah. and one thing I would like to just draw Jorge in is that in addition to the painting that he does, he is also a, a, an expert weaver. And there, I don't think there's more ritual involved than throwing that. What is it called? <laughs> Can you tell a me? Shuttle. A shuttle. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, it, I'm in sync with everything that's been said. I just want to start out with that because uh, the idea of repetition and ritual is also very important to me. I do work in silence. So for me, uh, having nothing else but the shuttle moving or, or the noise of the loom, or if I'm painting just the brushes scratching against the surface, that's plenty. And I, I do have a military background, so I used to love drill. I, I used to love just walking around the parade deck with uh, my fellow Marines. So the idea of something being done over and over in a very predictable pattern is incredibly important to me. Um, clearly the paintings that I have in this particular exhibition are not based so much, uh, well, they're not based on pattern and repetition. That is a big part of my other work as Rennie knows, but they are based on sculptures. So I start out with a small sculpture and then I either make a perspective drawing or I work directly from uh, an image of the sculpture. And so there's these steps that are compulsory and also ritualistic. And all of these processes are completely additive. I mean, almost everything I do is based on adding stuff rather than taking away. So that in itself becomes part of the ritual. Yes, sir. I, I should have shown your work in pairs because that's how they're displayed in the gallery, but uh, they'll, uh, we'll see that tomorrow in your interview. Um, the third question, and this is thrown at Stephen, uh, George, and Joan, is how does imagination and memory serve the idea of compulsory measures? Who's going first? <laughs> you, since you spoke. Okay. Well, uh, my, I do remember the first painting by a real artist that I ever saw. And I was about seven years old and it was The Descent from the Cross by Peter Paul Rubens in, uh, in Belgium, in Antwerp. And it left uh, a huge impression on me. I, obviously I didn't become a Baroque painter and I'm not doing religious art, but it, it was important in that it, um, it had over the top skills, it had drawing, it had drama, it was theatrical, it, the thing was big. And for a kid, it was just overwhelming. And it was one of those things that stayed with me even after we returned to the United States and settled in Richmond. So those memories, the, the memories of European architecture, Gothic churches, Baroque paintings, Flemish paintings, all of that, uh, the older I get, the more I realize that it informs me. I guess I can go. Um, I think for me, um, the, the memory, it, a little bit from uh, taking off of what um, George just said, yeah, there's the, the memory of, the history of art, like looking, you know, uh, at all the art I've looked at, um, you know, through my uh, schooling and, and, you know, beyond uh, comes into the work. So even though my, the, the work that's in this exhibition are just these, um, you know, layered micron marker line drawings, um, I, you know, there's a lot of influence from uh, Baroque art when I was in grad school, the, work I did was narrative figurative work and looked at Caravaggio a lot and, you know, other Baroque painters. Um, but uh, also just in the, the way I build the, this, this body of work, it's uh, from tracing moments from my past paintings. Um, so this kind of compulsive need to uh, hang on to, you know, uh, the, the moments of my uh, past art to, not forget about you know um, the stages that have led to uh, where I'm at in my work, I guess. So um, looking back at the past 25 or year, 25 years or more, um, and tracing those sections, and then figuring out how to um, put them back together into new compositions and and to find some kind of order out of that. So uh, even as I'm working these you know very abstracted tracings, because I you know I, I trace just sections, I still remember those you know when I'm looking at the pile of tracings I've gathered I can still remember what paintings they come from uh, what 
um, was going on in my life at that time. Maybe the audio audio book I was looking at or listening to while uh, making that piece of work. So all that memory is there as I'm layering and piling up and then trying to figure out which of those pieces of memory get uh, focus and attention in the composition. I guess it's my turn. <laughs> yeah, and I also have some notes like Christy did. Um, my work is so much about um, memory retrieval. I'm quoting experiences um, with the geometric patterns that I visited in person. The patterns themselves have a potency of the collected memories of those who's, who have lived with them in palaces, mosques, or community spaces, combined with my own memories of that encounter that I had with them while traveling. I'm incorporating the structure, but not the totality of the designs of my paintings. I'm interested in creating something new from the very old. I layer different patterns on top of each other to see what types of interactions I can find to visually weave between the designs. And this process is almost ritualistic, which we were all talking about before. Using small brushes with a devotion to detail and craft, producing a visual record of time as the surface has evolved. I'm combining the hunting and gathering of travel and memory retrieval with the practice of creating something new in the studio. The element of surprise in travel is a powerful one. You know, it makes you live in the present, and I am so missing that now. You know, we had hoped to, um, well, I really want to go to Iran, which that's just going to be probably impossible for a long time. But, um, you yeah, know, having all those plans scuttled, and when you're the type of person who loves that kind of stimulation, it's been a rough year. So, Anyone else feel free to jump in. I know we've talked uh, in, in our, our individual interviews about the importance of locations of memory and the way architecture plays into our work and structure plays into our work. So anyone can feel free to jump in on this. Actually, I have a question. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone else is feeling the same way. <laughs> um, with all the stuff that's going on, it feels like more and more is piled on instead of an ask of us, instead of maybe it's because um, I'm you know, teaching full time and uh, the chair and advisor in my department right now. But um, uh, instead of, you know, slowing down, and so it feels almost like this time is asking me to almost like, which is a process that happens in my work a lot, sort of destroy what I've done in the past, take some thread of it, and then move in a new direction and i'm contemplating what that direction is going to be and maybe that's a response to all this stuff that's going on um that's cons you know i so want to move forward somehow um and um it's a struggle um and so i see my um i'm just starting a new body of work with a different title a slightly different emphasis and i'm both sort of excited but afraid. Uh, I don't know, are any of you feeling that same way or find that that's happening in your work or? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. This I was talking about this yesterday in my individual um, uh, gallery talk or whatever interview. Um, I'm in the same spot. I, I've felt stuck in, in my work and, uh, you know what um, Jennifer was saying earlier about being an in introvert and this being the a great moment you know to be able to make work I'm an introvert too but it's been so hard because uh, um, you know teaching full-time online having uh, kids home and having to work with uh, them while they're doing uh, uh, you know online homeschooling uh, I'm chair of the faculty affairs committee which does reviews and tenure you know so lots lots of stuff um going on so i've been at this point in my work where i, I want some kind of change and then it and i think i know you know where i want it to go but it's scary because it's a it's going back to the still i, I i'm feeling because I, you know, the majority of the work i've been doing has been demonstration drawings for my classes i've been enjoying that <laughs> and, you know 
Uh, so I'm actually been enjoying setting up still lives again. I used to, you know, before I switched to abstraction, I was a still life painter and I'm trying to figure out ways to go back to that without, you know, ignoring the past, you know, almost 20 years of abstraction. And so it's probably, and you know, Rennie was um, yeah, at, at the uh, interview yesterday and, um, you know, made me feel good about the decision. Um, so uh, just, you know, uh, when she was hearing what I was saying, but it's just like um, holding on to the formal structures that are in the uh, abstract paintings and keeping those involved. And, in, you know, as I move it, or if, if I decide, I think I have decided to move in back into the, the um, uh, still lives, but then, then figuring out maybe what to do with those still lives too, to bring them back to some abstraction. So maybe vacillating between the two, um, genres instead of thinking I have to be one or the other. If I didn't just ramble, sorry. No, no, no. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. You know, I'm. Um, you know, I'm also chairing the art and art history department, and it's such a strange time to be doing that. Um, and you know, none of us have had the summer. You know, all of us have had to do all these, you know, I, who knew I became pretty good at editing videos, you know, uh, this summer, you know, for my teaching demonstrations, because, you know, we're not gathering around tables anymore. They're looking at my disembodied hands and hearing my disembodied voice do stuff, you know, so... Um, so, it, and it's been a very hard time to make um, work, but I've been reminded that, you know, we sort of have to keep on. So now I'm looking at the hand surgery. Apparently I've cut the tendon filming one of those demonstrations and now I have it, you know, it's lost the mobility. So I need to try to reattach it and so on. And it's my left hand, my dominant hand that I'm thinking, um, you know what? I've always been one of those very left-handed people. I'm going to do a right-handed drawing a day. They're probably going to be ridiculous. I have no stake in it. But, um, and if I can mention one other thing about the memories, the last time I traveled before everything shut down, I was in Utah. I was at University of Utah and I got to visit Al's studio. So, um, and actually I did not know to what extent this memory of this really great trip, we did like this great project. I visited Al's studio. We went out and saw Nancy Holt's uh, sun tunnels. I mean, it was just great times and then blam, everything shut down. Um, so anyway, I think about that trip a lot and I'm wondering what is going to come out of all these experiences, speaking to our students remotely, to our colleagues remotely. Um, um, Tanya, I hope you are, get the surgery and heal quickly. And um, yeah. I, maybe it is that yeah. there's, so many changes going on and everything feels new that I'm also finding myself in the studio doing something completely different. I'm actually doing fiber and sculpture pieces in my studio. Um, you know, so I think it is this, this kind of liminal space where it's like, because everything seems so ill-defined, it seems like a good time to, to branch out a little bit and, um, see what new things I can do. And, uh, um, hopefully not fail too terribly. Um. I have the, the advantage of being retired. And so I don't have to struggle with the online teaching. And I'm forever grateful for that. I'm, my heart goes out to all of you that are still in the French trying to figure that piece out. Great timing, Granny. Great timing. <laughs> <laughs> but you know and Jorge yeah <laughs> yeah and then Jorge is retired as well so um that you know maybe we're in a better zone but I I just go down there and and putter I guess if you will and I've got things I'm working on but you know if they're any good who knows you know it doesn't really matter at this point <laughs> you know I'm just gonna keep making the stuff and decide later what to do with it or not do with it I, that seems kind of ridiculous, but um, 
what else? I mean, it's sort of like we're all kind of just treading water in some ways, um, waiting to see what, what we can do next. You know, I try to console parents, you know, in my department by saying, hey, you know, that there are kids that have gone through wars and stuff. Kids will be okay. It's all school. It is all education. You know, kids will be all right. Uh, I don't know about us, but... Um, yeah, I think... Um, I don't know, to me, it feels like the world is just sidestepped completely. And, um, you know, one minute we were all preparing to go on different trips and all these exhibitions and projects that we had going on. And the next minute it was all, it was all off. And, um, you know, I think it, it, it's forcing, I think as, as artists, the good thing about us is we're creative people, so we have the tools to to make make it happen, what whatever that's going to be. Um, but for me, I think um, when everything sort of initially initially shut down, um, for example, the the gallery that represents me had had just opened a show, or we're about to open a show, and suddenly that's it. No, no one's seeing this work and. Um, for me, this, this was actually quite a profound thing to happen because um, with my work, I really like people to see it in person, to get close and to really um, understand how the work was made. And that's, that's a really important part about um, my aesthetic of what I do. And so for me, although I was, you know, yeah, in my studio working like crazy, um, it also led me to really rethink, you know, how are people going to see my work and how is this change of events going to affect how people can see what I'm doing? And it, it kind of just, I don't, just, I think just different opportunities came up and um, I found myself doing um, some very different projects that i would actually never really done before, and that is uh, getting involved in three different public art projects, which has been a, a really interesting process for me because I've had to really completely rethink how I work and also my imagery. And so one of the projects was to create um, an image of a full-size, figure of a, a woman um, using a particular stencil technique. So it was almost going, like going back to school to, to learn, oh yeah, how do I do this again? Yeah, yes, that's how I do it. And, um, and then the other two projects are basically I involved creating a drawing first. Uh, one was a drawing, one was a painting, which, which are going to be reproduced. One is going to be reproduced in as laser cut into steel, the other is going to be printed as um, a billboard. So it's just a very interesting time, I think, when I look back over the last few months, like, yeah, I, I don't think I ever would have done those public art projects if, if this situation wasn't with us. So it, I, I kind of see it as a good thing and it's taken me in a slightly different direction, which is, which is great. Do we have any questions from our attendees? I know at least one has seen the show in person because it's an on-campus person, but do you have any questions for the, our, our panelists? While you're thinking of your questions, um, George, do you want to say anything, add anything about? Well, um, I feel a little guilty after hearing everyone talk about the current situation because it's actually given me an excuse to be a recluse and it's a tendency I fought my whole life and now I have a wonderful reason to be one. But um, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's been annoying more than anything. It's, however, I will say I love being in the studio every day without interruptions. And that's been, I, I never imagined that my life would ever afford me that. So in that respect, it's been good. I will say that the, my students, um 
appreciated not having to be in this grid formation of desks that are exactly six feet apart. And the, the first thing we did was come up in the gallery and just walk around. Um, they, of course, ignored all the floor signs that say walk in one direction. So they just sort of meandered and picked their champion to write about. But it was you know, that experience of being able to walk up to a work and walk away from it, especially with something like owls that require, it's, in, it's under glass, so you need to be um, physically active in the gallery in order to see the work properly, I think. So if we've been missing that, I think. I will certainly agree with that. You know, I'm very happy now that museums and galleries are reopening here in Miami and that idea of, you know, going to see art and nurturing myself and my, my own practice in that way. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, going back to the, uh, when George said, you know, his first experience of uh, the art that he remembers, um, would, you know, I grew up in upstate New York, uh, t you know, my father was a truck driver. So my first experience of art was Norman Rockwell calendars. And uh, just uh, like a, a month ago or so, I, I got to go up in to the Norman Rockwell Museum in Massachusetts and, and then Mass Mocha and some others. But uh, just being able to see art again and, you know, experience it is, you know, uh, a, a good breath of fresh air. Yeah, I know, like John, a lot of my um, research comes through my travels, and I had a lot of a lot of travel planned for last year. And I know, Jennifer, I think your residency was canceled. Um, my trip to Europe was canceled. I'm just, and I'm already planning. I got plans to go, to go when I can go. And I'm just wondering, are other are you? Uh, let's see, are other of you thinking about where you're going to go? Like John, where are you going to go? The first month well, you can go. <laughs> well, um, well, I, I have a sabbatical. I am done chairing the department um, on June 30th, but who's counting the days? Um, and, and then I'm going to be on a year-long sabbatical, and I'm really hoping to go back to my hometown, to Sarajevo, um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, when I... When I left it to immigrate to U.S., it was still in Yugoslavia. Thankfully, there are a lot of people on this call that are old enough to remember Yugoslavia. You know, so <laughs> um, and um, so because you know, I need to I, I need to do some research and I need to do some photography there for I think some things that are very slowly bubbling up. So that's where I hope to go. First, and of course, to see my mom who um, lives in Croatia nearby. So, so um, Rennie mentioned the residency that I had that was canceled, which was a drawing research residency in Paris mm -hmm. that was supposed to happen in March. So, um, that has been rescheduled for March of 2021. Um, so that's one of the first things that I hope to do. I will say the positive aspect of this happening has been even though um, the group of artists that were supposed to meet in Paris for that residency, we've yet to meet in person, we've been able to use WhatsApp and other social media to get to know each other. And we've had um, a couple of virtual events and an upcoming virtual exhibition um, already. So it's sort of like, I'm even a little, well, I'm always excited to go to Paris, but I'm more excited to go now um, to join this group of artists um, because I feel like we front loaded and we sort of, we have a stronger understanding of each other's work um, and the ideas behind each other's work um, so that we can, you know, collaborate and do some interesting things when we do arrive in Paris. Um, all my fingers crossed um, this upcoming March. And then hopefully after that, over the summer, I'll be able to spend a month in Scotland uh, in an artist residency there. Yeah, uh, my wife and I were supposed to go to Greece this summer and then Germany. And so hopefully, um, you know, next summer or whenever we uh, are allowed to travel again, uh, we get to hit those two destinations. We do have one question in the chat box, um, and uh, Al uh, 
referred to this a little bit with uh, how she's pivoting, which is our new favorite word these days on campuses. Um, how has isolation made you rethink your art in relation to the public? I don't know. For, for me, it's, um, I mean, actually taking on the public art projects um, seemed just really relevant right now because that's how, it's a way for people to see my work. Uh, they can't go to the gallery, so, but they can see it within the public art realm. And so it was, it just seemed like a, a very natural step when these projects came up to, to just go for it and say, yeah, great, I'll do this. And, Go ahead, Kirsty. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm just the series that I made for compulsory measures um, takes sort of older threads um, or previous threads in my work and um, makes them larger in scale in a sense and focuses them slightly differently. Um, but what I've been working on more recently in the studio is um, sort of taking the those illusionistic images of fabric and then um, uh, including uh, uh, sort of two characters, Rabbit and Kitty Boy, uh, that are in um, sort of adventure, adventures, mostly Rabbit, of um, uh, actually they're it's very much social commentary um, using the holidays as um, ways to focus uh, that commentary. And they're actually very, they're filled with dark humor and very much about what's happening now. Um, so um, ra rather cynical, although I think um, there's always um, a kind of layer of hope in them. Um, and as I finished that, my husband, um, uh, this is our, uh, we did a, uh, in my previous series, um, Through the Veil, my husband wrote a book um, responding to um, that painting series, and now he's writing a, a book uh, responding to um, my paintings and holidays unfolding. Um, so that's an interesting process. But actually, I guess maybe going out of that sort of dark humor, I think I'm trying to find my way, um, and thus my que earlier question, into um, something maybe more positive. So uh, what I'm thinking about now is um, a series called um, uh, Disrupted Gardens or Gardens Interrupted um, that uh, takes things in a little bit different way. But I guess maybe thinking of the environment and um, uh, something larger uh, than some of the stuff that's happening, um, but still um, uh, uncovering uh, things that happen in the environment that we need to address, um, but in maybe a transcendent spiritual way. Uh, I'm not sure if I explained that accurately, but uh, and you'd have to see the other work, uh, but a hint of maybe it made sense. <laughs> It made sense <laughs> to me. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say in response to the uh, question, um, I, get, I I try not to think too much about the public. Um, I try to make sure the work works for me or it's something I want to do first, and then I hope that it gets out and um, you know can be seen by the public. But I, I think. That, the subtle thread that does get in there uh, in relation to maybe, uh, maybe not the public, but what's going on in the world um, is, you know, maybe just thinking about the complexity of the composition to mirror the complexity of what we're going through, the tension and the drama that, that's out in, you know, the world outside of our stupid walls. Yeah, I, I guess I'd like to connect to what Stephen just said very eloquently. Um, you know, when you make a work of art, you sort of, it's kind of like you, you send this being in the world and, you know, you kind of have to trust it, that there is, um, you know, except maybe for very conceptual artists, you know, that, that, you know, generally we need to make things in order to think. And, you know, when I'm not making art, it's not just 
that it's sad because I'm not making art, but it's sad because, you know, I don't feel I'm using my brain fully. <laughs> and, um, and that part doesn't so much have to do with the audience. It's not about, oh, I don't care about audience. We all very much care about having an audience and what audience thinks and responses and so on. But that is sort of like a business of my artwork, not my business so much anymore. Once I release it, once I make it, I'm trusting not that people, everybody's going to get what's been going through my mind when I was making it, but I trust that something in it will connect. And right now, as Stephen has said and others have said, we are putting a lot of our anxiety, we are, we are you know, every work of art is a piece of its own time as much as it's a work of artists. So, you know, we are putting a lot of this kind, this, this, this tension into the work. It will be interesting to see in decades to come and further, you know, um, you know, what was really happening, what, how this swerve, um, how did this kind of a big continental divide, you know, did, was it the continental divide, you know, how, how profound a change has this pandemic and this political moment we are finding ourselves in, um, you know, how big a crater was left, let's put it that way. Oops, I didn't mean to end on like all apocalyptic note or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, it, this this exhibition and all the work in it really does resonate with what's going on with COVID um, and the pandemic. But it was conceived, um, you know, two years prior to to having you know the shutdown. And um, I think all of us deal with the ritual and the process and the making as a way to make sense of what's going on around us, whether it's the the pandemic or the politics or global warming or whatever it is. Um, and it, it's timely, certainly right now, but I mean, it goes way back to my interest in things from the turn of the century, you know, and um, I, what I hope in through my work is that in a way, the viewer can unpack my process in making it and, and vicariously, only visually, of course, have a similar kind of experience, you know, that would slow them down enough to become more contemplative or more centered or more mindful in the looking at the work that the making of the work provides to me. And so I'm always thinking about it out in the world, even if it's going to be a while <laughs> before I get to yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. That was certainly my goal uh, for bringing this show to campus. And I didn't know at the time that, you know, of course, what, what situation we would be in. But um, you wanted to focus on some sort of mental health aspect with mind, either whether it be mindfulness strategies or, or ritualistic strategies. And at this point, I'm really wanting my students to be able to accept this, the imperfections that you said exist when you're trying to repeat something and replicate something and create a rhythm that there's going to be those little bumps that make this individual to this moment to this person. And it's, I hope that they see the value in that and the value in going to a real versus a virtual experience. So I want to thank you all. We're running out uh, against our time limit. So I want to thank you all for contributing to this very timely and relevant uh, conversation. For those watching, I hope you can catch the remaining four episodes of this series tomorrow, Friday, September 25. I'll be talking to Christy Dietz at 11 a.m. and George Benitez at 1 p.m. EST. On Monday, September 28, we'll be talking with Al Denyer at 1 p.m. EST. And on Wednesday, September 30, we'll be talking with Joan Elliott, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll make this full series available on our website and YouTube, and please find us on Facebook or Instagram for our updates on our programs. I also want to mention that this catalog of all the works in the show is available as, uh, for purchase and download from blurb.com and we'll also post that link to our website. So 
So I want to thank you all panelists for joining us tonight and for contributing to this series, for talking with me and answering my students' questions and uh, responding to our panelists. Um, before we close, are there any closing words you guys want to say to our audience? So yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you, guys. Okay, thank you so much. Everyone stay safe and healthy and have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. So good to see everyone. Bye-bye. Yes, Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you. It was great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.